we're going to be looking at what it means to be a Christian. And I think if you did a church poll and you were asking people what it means to be a Christian, many people, one of their first answers would be, it means that you prayed a prayer and you asked Jesus into your heart. And yes, and I mean, that's part of being a Christian. You know, we definitely uh, have to commit ourselves to God. There is definitely a confession of sin and a receiving of his salvation and his love and all of that. But I'm telling you, there are a whole lot of people who have prayed a prayer of salvation who don't know Jesus. <laughs> there, there, there have been a whole lot of movements and different things that, that man has created to try to get people in. Like there, there's situations where we try to, uh, you, you had movements a period of time where it was hellfire and brimstone where you're trying to scare them into hell. And You know, you used to have a play that would go around, and if you offered it at your church, are you playing in it or anything like that? This isn't a judgment thing, you know. But but we've had you know hell's fire or or heaven's gates and hell's flames, you know the the play, and 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 you have you know nine uh, thousand people who get saved in a course of a week, and then church attendance goes up three people. So where did everybody go? You, you got Judgment House, where we literally try to scare the hell out of people. Just, but people have an emotional connection in that moment, and then nothing happens. Or we try to pull on the heartstrings and different things, and we can bring people. Man has came up with many philosophies that have been able to bring people to an emotional response to Jesus in order to have a prayer. But then you don't see changes. Show me one place where Jesus or his disciples said, if you want to be saved, you repeat after me. You're not going to find it. So praying a prayer and asking Jesus into your heart is a part of the start of Christianity, but it definitely isn't the all in all of what a Christian is. Well, some people may say, well, people who are faithful to church. If you're a Christian, you're going to be faithful to church. But there are people who go to church week in and week out who never open their Bible the rest of the week. They don't have prayer except for when they're praying over their food. You look at their life and the way that they treat their spouse or the way that they treat their kids or they treat people and everything, and you don't see no Jesus in that. If church attendance was what would lead to Christianity and and everything, then Jesus' message would be, go to the temple, be in the synagogues. The disciples would put the whole focus on the temple. They wouldn't be in, why would they have home groups and prayer meetings and, uh, and all this stuff? In the book of Acts, you wouldn't have seen that. They would have been trying to draw the crowd to the temple because being faithful to temple it's what saves you, but how many of the Pharisees were faithful to that? It's not even just reading your Bible. The Pharisees could quote the first five books of the Bible. The Messiah is standing in front of them, and they don't even realize it. Well, people, you, you, you got to pray the prayer. You got to attend church, and then if you serve faithfully, well, then, like, It's amazing like we put this checklist of all the things that you have to do to be a Christian, but then the gospel is that you're not saved because of what you do, you're saved because of what he did. Do you see like the hypocrisy and the error in this? as far as what it means to be a Christian, because none of these things are things that Jesus and his disciples preached on as being results of being Christian. In fact, when Jesus, if you look at what Jesus said, if you want to be a disciple of mine, in in, in Luke chapter 9, verse 23, he says, if you wish to come after me, then you've got to deny yourself. You've got to take up your cross daily, Y'all see that word there? I should have underlined that because some of us, we look at it as weekly. Uh, Now it's getting more like monthly. As long as I go to church monthly. 
You see, the problem is, is if you think church attendance is what means you're a Christian, then you'll just put a priority on being in church and that's all it'll be. You'll still live your life the way that you want. If you think serving in church is what's going to make you saved, you're, Jesus said before this, you can keep that scripture up there, but Jesus said in Matthew 7, there are going to be many people who come to me and say, Lord, Lord, we healed the sick. We prophesied in your name. We cast out demons in your name. And he's going to look at them and say, depart from me. I never knew you. So I guess serving, they faithfully prophesied. They faithfully cast out demons. They faithfully healed the sick. Most of us probably haven't prophesied, healed the sick, or cast out a demon in our entire walk with God. So if it's about our works and what we do, then why are these people saying we did all these amazing religious acts in your name? And Jesus said, that's great, but I don't know you. I don't, I don't know who you are. You see, that's why it can't be a weekly thing. It can't be a monthly thing. What type of relationship can you develop with somebody when you see them once a month? What type of relationship can you develop with somebody if you only see them once a week and there's no communication? You're, there, you come in and you hear somebody talk about the individual, but you never ask questions. You never see, well, how does this relate to me? How can I connect? Like, it's just you come, you hear about somebody, and then you leave. You're not going to develop a relationship with that. They don't know you. How many people would Jesus, if he was in the church world today, standing on an altar preaching a message, would Jesus look out and not know relationally because all it was was them just hearing things? That's why he said, listen, if you're going to come after me, you've got to deny yourself. You can't make your world all about you. You've got to take up your cross daily, and you've got to follow me. And then he takes it even more, because whoever wishes to save his life is going to lose it. So what we've done in America is we said, you can be saved with church attendance six days a week. Do whatever you want. Just be faithful to God one day a week. You can have your life, and you can have Jesus as an add-on on your life. And if you call now, <laughs> in the next five minutes, we'll even give you the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Or if you call now, like... He said, no, 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 no. When you come to me, you can't continue the life. It's, you can't just continue to do everything that you've always done and live for you. No, 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 no. You've got to lose your life. Because the person who's trying to save their life is going to end up losing it. And he's talking about eternal life. But the person who loses their life for my name's sake, We'll save it. For too long, we've made Jesus an add-on to our life versus Jesus being the center of our life. And the big problem with that is when Jesus isn't the center of our life, then we're not making decisions based on what's best for him and our relationship with him and his kingdom. We're making decisions based on what's best for us. So if it's more convenient for me to camp at the lake, then I'm going to continue to camp at the lake, and, but I'm going to have church on on my iPhone on the side while you're distracted getting lunch ready and all of these things. And so even though you may be hearing part of what we're saying, listen, this is why when we talk, and I think this is very important, I think everybody needs, because we talked about it, meeting together in the homes and everything and, and that type of thing. Like, and there is value on that. You do not have to be inside these four walls to be in church. But when you, if you are having church remotely, then two things need to happen. One, there needs to be a high priority on what's taking place so that you are truly worshiping and truly listening and engaging, taking notes, whatever it is, so that you are as connected in another room as you would be if you were in this room. We have it all the time. Our Summersville campus watches in every week to the word that is being preached here. 
and they can experience the same presence of God and all of those things that we do. They connect in, they amen me, shout me down, sometimes better than Mount Hope does. And we see salvations, we see altar responses and people coming to the Lord. Why? Because they have eliminated distractions. They're not up grilling and stuff in the middle of the Summersville Sanctuary. They're not up playing around. They don't have their kids playing over here while they're doing this and all this stuff. They are focused and attentive because they want to hear what the word of the Lord is for this time. And they're leaned in and their attention is there. And so they're connected. We have to make sure that we don't just try to include God as part of our life. And I have no problem with taking vacations and missing a church service here or there and that type of thing. But there needs to be a priority on when we are in church. Like I told my kids last week, because we were out of town last week, and uh, like they're all talking and doing stuff. I was like, be quiet, we're in church. You would not be doing this if we were sitting in the building. We in church, listen to Pastor Mark. Why? Because if I'm going to call that my church experience, I need to be as connected in in that church experience as I am right here. Not just bringing them in on part of the thing. See, we almost think following Jesus is like following somebody on Instagram. That when one of his posts comes across our feed, then we'll even like it. We'll even share it. But it's not like that. You can't just drop by on Sundays and hear a little message. Like, if you don't take what is spoken and do something with it, then you are wasting your time. And actually, you're in a worse condition. Because the person who knows what they're supposed to do and don't do it, to them it's sin. So it's better not to know it than to know it and not do it. When Jesus called his disciples, they left everything. They they left their comfort. Peter, James, and John, when they followed him, they were leaving their, 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 uh, their jobs. They were leaving their careers, everything that they were getting ready to happen. But why? Because discipleship can't take place long distance. Like there is a certain level of discipleship and stuff that can take place. And so when you look at him calling his followers to him, who he's going to invest in them to build the church, it wasn't a long distance thing where he said, I'm going to send you a letter or I'm going to do whatever. It wasn't that type of a thing. It was, hey, you need to come and you need to follow me every day of your life. And so they did. Even in the Old Testament, the call to serve God was not a call to church attendance or minor thing. The call in the Old Testament, you think about Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. He says, listen, I want you to leave everything you know, your family, your comfort, all that you have, and I want you to come to a place that I'm not even going to tell you where you're going, but I want you to follow me. Why didn't he tell him where he was going? Because he wanted to keep communication in between him day by day. Sometimes in our life, God doesn't show us the end result because he wants us to stay connected with him day by day so that he can lead us day by day. That's why he even said, when you pray your prayer, pray that God would give you your daily bread. That's not talking about your food. It's talking about the word of God that you get every single day. But there's another example in the Old Testament of Elijah and Elisha, and it's found in in 1 Kings chapter 19. Go ahead and pull that one up for me. First Kings 19, Elijah and Elisha uh, are, are, Elisha is getting ready to be called to follow Elijah, who is the prophet of God. And it said, so he had departed from uh, where he was. This is after Elijah had called down fire from heaven and, and everything. And, and, you know, he's kind of battling with depression and all this stuff. And God's telling him, listen, I'm, I'm calling you to go anoint some people who are going to take your place and are going to do some things for my kingdom. So Elijah gets up. And it says he departed from there and he found Elisha uh, and he was plowing with seven uh, yoke of oxen that was in front of him. And he was with the twelfth and Elijah passed by him and he cast his cloak upon him. Now for us, that means nothing. Like, okay, he's plowing, 
What does it matter that Elijah took his coat and threw it upon uh, Elisha? And that, that coat was a symbol of the authority, the symbol of the prophetic anointing and things that was on his life. It, you'll see other places where it was called the mantle. And when he put that on Elisha, he was saying, Elisha, it's time to come follow me. Like, come with me. Right now, you're going to follow me as I follow God. And I'm going to teach you some things that's going to help you in your calling when, when I'm gone that's going to prepare you for who you need to be. And it says that he left and he ran after Elijah. So he just, he just dropped the coat on him and walked. Like he didn't say he stopped and explained it. He didn't say anything. He just threw the coat. And he's, he keeps on walking, and so Elisha runs after him real quick, and he said, listen, let me run back, let me kiss my mom and my dad, and then I'm going to come, and I'm going to follow you. And, and he says uh, that he went back again, and, and, and then it says that he returned after him, and he took the yoke of oxen, verse 21, and he sacrificed them, he boiled their flesh, the yokes of oxen, and he gave it to the people, and they ate, and then he arose, and he followed Elijah and assisted him. You've heard the phrase, burning your bridges? Like, <laughs> his oxen were, hit. That, that's how he made his living. He literally burned. He wanted to make sure there was nothing pulling him back. It could be more comfortable here. You could have more money here. Remember back in your father's house. Remember back this. He said, I'm not going to do that. I've watched many people step out and start serving in ministry. And then the pool of what they've had to give up starts pulling on them. And they just turn right back around and they just walk back. And Elisha's like, no, no, no. I realize what's happening here. He's not just calling me to follow him. He's calling me to follow God by following him. And he goes after him and he he begins to serve, he burns his plows, he sacrifices the oxen, he gives it away to all the people and everything to keep him from going back. And then you see in 2 Kings chapter 2, it picks up the story again. And it says the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elisha and Elijah were on their way from Gil Gilgal. And Elijah looked at Elisha and he said, please stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives and you live yourself, I will not leave you and so they went down to Bethel so Elijah knows he's getting ready to go essentially he looks at Elisha and says listen Elisha if you're following me this thing's getting ready to end this is a dead end job because I'm getting ready to be taken out of here I'm going to be gone and so he's testing him are you following me or are you following God because if you're following me this is a dead end job just go home now and Elisha's like, I am not going anywhere because he realized that by following Elijah, he's following God's plan and God's will for his life. And I'm sure he's thinking, Elijah, I've already burnt the, the plows, the oxen. I don't have anything to go back to. I'm 100% in with where you're going and what God is calling me to do. He goes on and says, the sons of the prophets who were in Bethel, they came out to Elisha and they said, do you know that your Lord will be taken away from you? Uh, your master is going to be uh, taken away from you today. And he said, yeah, I know that. Just be quiet. Just, I know. It's all good. <laughs> then Elijah looks at him. So you got people saying, why are you still following him? He's getting ready to go. This is about to be over. You burned everything for this? Elijah's getting ready to be taken away. Why are you still following him? Nah, be quiet. Can I tell you something? You are always going to have people who try to get you to quit walking with God, and you need to do exactly like it. Right, that's good, but be quiet. Be still. I ain't got time for that. Then Elijah says, stay here. Because uh, I'm going to Jericho. And he says, as the Lord lives and as you live yourself, I will not leave you. And so they went on to Jericho. Elijah again gives him the opportunity to leave. Sons of the prophet who were in Jericho came down to Elisha. Don't you know that today the Lord is going to take your master from you? 
Yes, I know. They already told me that in Bethel. <laughs> Just keep quiet. I, don't, I know what I'm doing. Elijah tries to run. Like, if we had this scenario happen in the church world today, if I came into the church and I said, hey, guys, it's been an amazing nine years, which, by the way, today I believe makes exactly nine years since we started the church. <laughs> Woo it's been an amazing nine years. This has been great, but I'm leaving tomorrow. Y'all oh, got. I'm done. God's taking me. Do you realize how many people would leave the church? Because they were following me, not following Christ. If Stephen Furtick stood up at Elevation Church and said, okay, this week's my last week. See y'all. I'm gone. You watch the mega church that's reaching the world you go down to a smaller church. Why? Because they're following the personality, not following God. Elisha wasn't following. His relationship with God was not through Elijah. Now, Elijah was the, the, the leader who he was following at the moment. But whether it, he's already proven it. The prophets keep saying, he's leaving, he's leaving, he's leaving, he's going, he's going, he's going. And Elijah's like, I don't care, be quiet. Elijah tries to, Elisha, I'm, I'm quiet, I don't want to hear it. Elijah tries to get him to turn back. No, I'm not going. I'm, 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 I'm not leaving you. He completely refused to leave because he wasn't following Elijah. He was following God. And then it goes on in verse 6. Or, I'm sorry. They uh, are getting ready to cross over. To the, uh, they crossed over the Jordan River, and so he went over, and he took the, the mantle, he hit the water, and it parted, and they crossed over to the place where they were going, and he said, please stay here at the Jordan. He said, as the Lord lives, I'm not going to leave you. And two of them go on, verse 9, says, when they crossed over the Jordan River, uh, he said, what, 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 am I, what do you want me to do for you? He said, I see the anointing that's on your life. I want a double portion of what I see in your life. I see the Spirit of God that's on you, and I want that, but I want it double. You see, Elisha had an understanding here. You go all the way back to when Aaron was anointed to be the priest, and it says that the oil ran down, and it talks about it even running down his beard, and it was dripping. He understood that when he was submitted under this authority, that the anointing that was on Elijah's life was pouring down in his life. He didn't see it. Because at this point, what Elisha was known as is as the person who poured water on Elijah's hands. After Elijah's gone, they're looking for somebody to prophesy. I think it's King Jehoshaphat's looking for somebody to prophesy. And he was like, hey, there's this prophet. He used to pour water on the hands of Elijah. So it's not like Elisha is having his own meetings. Elisha isn't getting up and preaching all the time. It's not like they're tag team, all this stuff. As far as Elisha is just serving behind the scenes. But Elijah looks at him and says, what is it that you want? He said, I want a double portion of what's on your life. And then Elijah said, it's a hard thing that you ask for. But if you see me when I'm taken, it will be uh, so for you. But if you don't see me, it's not going to happen. Now, think about this, especially people who feel called into ministry. How many young ministers want the anointing and want the position and want the power and the influence that they see in somebody else, but they want the microwave version of it? They want you to just tell them the secret recipe of how you see success. But can I tell you, the secret recipe, Jesus already gave it to us. If you want to be a disciple of mine and follow me, take up your cross daily. Deny yourself daily. Follow me. Stop trying 
to live your life. In fact, lose your life. Because when you lose your life is when you're going to find true life. And as long as you're trying to hold on to your life, you're going to lose the true life of what God wants. That doesn't sound like the gospel we preach today or we hear today. Follow me. It says that Elijah was taken in the next scripture and he threw down the mantle. You know what Elisha did? He went over and he picked up the mantle. He rolled it up and he walks back over toward the Jordan River and he takes the mantle and he hits the Jordan River. Now that sounds like a silly thing to do. Why in the world am I going to run up? Like, he wasn't frustrated and upset. It wasn't an emotional thing. I mean, he's gone. No. You know, that type of thing. It wasn't. Not. The reason why he went over to the Jordan and he hit it is because that's how they had crossed coming over. He just began to follow in the footsteps of what he's seen in Elijah's life. I saw God work through Elijah in this way. And if he cast this thing down, like he wasn't like, okay, did I get the anointing or did I not get the anointing? Oh, no, he's really gone. Like it wasn't no inner turmoil or anything. He just picked it up and was like, I asked for it. He told me I would have it. So I am who he says I am. Boom. Jordan River parts. And he goes. And he works exactly twice the amount of miracles that Elijah did. The double portion of anointing transferred. But this is exactly what Jesus did with his disciples. He brought them in. He did life with them. Like sometimes we, it is so hard to get the church in America to meet together in homes and to understand this principle. Like, we're not just trying to see how many people we can get to come to a Bible study. Especially if you are a younger believer, you need to find a mature believer that you see God in them. You see God in their marriage. You see the way that they act. You see the fruit of God that you want in your life. And you need to go say, hey, can I come to your house and eat dinner with you? Can I come mow your grass? Can I come help you clean? Can I come do any? I just want, I want to do life with you because I see something in you that I need. I need to come learn from you. When Jesus had his disciples around him, he wasn't just showing off his power in what he could do. It wasn't a, hey guys, come watch this. See that funeral over there? I'm about to go interrupt that thing. Let me go knock on that casket. And raise. He was teaching them how to live a spirit-empowered life. He was showing them all these miracles that you've seen me do. You've got access to it. He even told them when he's getting ready to go in John 14 through 16 in that range, he's talking about the Holy Spirit. He said, it's even better for me to go to heaven because I'm going to send the Spirit and he's going to lead you and he's going to guide you. He's going to, he's going to point all people to me and he's going to teach you all these things. He's going to lead you every step of the way. And the things that you saw me do, even greater things than what I did, you're going to be able to do. And then he looks at them and he gives them a commission that almost seems like it's impossible. Pull up that, that verse in Mark uh, 16, I believe. The Great Commission there. It says, he told them, go into all the world. Proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Okay, This part we've heard before, right? The Great Commission, everybody. This is yes. Y'all just looking at me like. No. Okay. We've heard this. Go into all the gospel. Proclaim the gospel as a whole creation. Whoever believes in me and is baptized will be saved. And whoever does not believe in me will be condemned. Okay? So he tells them, go make disciples, right? 
And in the very next verse, he tells these disciples who have been with him, these signs are going to follow those people who believe. All right. Let me explain this real quick here. He's not saying those people who believe that these signs will happen, if you have enough faith that you can heal somebody, then you can heal somebody. He's not saying that. In context, he said, the people who will believe this commandment that I'm giving them to go into the world and preach the gospel and make disciples, they, go pull, pull up 16 for me again so I can show it on the screen. They're looking at me like I don't know what I'm talking about here. My big screen here, you got it? Whoever believes in the gospel that Jesus, that God is the, the, the you know, creator of the universe, all that, that, whoever believes in the gospel and is baptized will be saved. So he's talking about Christians here. A sign of being a Christian, because the very next thing he said, the people who don't believe are going to be condemned. So he said, there's two scenarios here, people. There are Christians and there are non-Christians. There are believers and there are not people who uh, don't believe. This isn't even a whole thing about, do I believe in the gifts of the Spirit still being applicable for today's life? Do I believe in this? Do I believe? It's none of that religious stuff right now. If you are a believer... And if you are saved, now, next verse, then these signs and wonders will. These signs will. Say that with me. I am a whole lot more fired up and excited about this than you are. Y'all got to help me here. If you're a believer, how many believers we got? Come on, Summersville. If you're saved, how many people we got saved? You, you, all right. These signs will. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mickey. <laughs> Y'all caught that word that time. Not they might. Not they might. It's a possibility. If they fast enough, if they give enough, if they attend church enough, if they serve faithfully enough. No, 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 no. If you're saved, now do you get it? If you are saved, these signs and wonders will accompany them. One translation puts it this way. They will follow them. How many people do we have that are looking around trying to follow signs and wonders? Jesus said it's a wicked generation that follows signs and wonders. This is how people will be deceived. Even if you look in the Old Testament, Pharaoh's magicians could work some of the magic. So we don't follow signs and wonders. Signs and wonders follow us. There we go, a couple more, it's starting to sink in there. All right. Signs and wonders follow us. So you know what that means? When we set up in Bluefield, Pastor Jonathan, and we're doing a food truck, those signs and wonders of being able to cast out demons, speak in tongues, hold on, he lists them here. So in case you wonder what the signs and wonders are, cast out demons, speak in new tongues, pick up serp serpents and with their hands. If they drink any deadly poison, it won't harm them. Go ahead, next verse, 18. Come on, catch up with me here. Lay hands on the sick. And what is, what's that? They what? Thank you, Pastor. <laughs> they will recover. So why aren't we seeing it more? This is going to sound a little harsh. What did Jesus say it was going to be to be a follower of him? Go all the way back to the beginning. 
Luke chapter 9. Pull it up. No, back. The opposite way. 9.23. The very beginning of it. My pro presenter people love it when I go out of order on my slides. This is why. Jesus said that a believer looks like this. They deny themselves. They take up their cross daily, and they follow him. They lose their life for his name's sake. It is not that we don't have enough faith. It is not that the gifts of the Spirit have stopped. It's that we're not taking up our cross. We care too much about our 401k. We care too much about whether our kids are going to get into college and get a college scholarship for athletics. We care too much about what other people think about us. But if you look at Elisha, he just burned it all and followed him. You look at the disciples, they left it all. They left their retirement fund. Keys, y'all can come on up, whoever's on keys. They left it all to follow him. But not everybody was willing to leave it all. Think of the rich young ruler. You can go back to where we were now. The rich young ruler said, I've kept all your commandments. I've attended synagogue. I've served faithfully. I've made the, the Christian list. I've done it all. Since I was a little kid, I cut my teeth on those church pews. One thing you lack, go sell what you have, give it to the poor and follow me. What's he asking for? Give up your lifestyle. I want to see if you're willing to deny yourself. I want to see if you're willing to take up your cross and follow me. It says a rich young ruler went away sorrowful because he had many possessions. He couldn't do it. His life was too good. His life was too comfortable. You had the opportunity to intern with Jesus. He's watching the Messiah heal the sick, raise the dead, multiply the loaves of bread, cast out demons. He's watching it with his own eyes. That's why he was drawn to him. And yet he looked and said, that price is too much, I can't do it. It's no wonder that 2,000 years removed, people have a hard understanding. But part of it is because, and this isn't, it's not around the world that people don't have the understanding of losing their life. It's just here. Because we've got our comfortable house. We've got our nice vehicle. And I'm not saying that you have to give all that stuff. God doesn't come to everybody and say, give up everything that you want, sell it and follow me. Some people, it's like, just use the life that you're living. Let me be the center of that life and I can use you in your job. I can use you in your place of employment. I can use your nursing skills. I can use those things for my kingdom. But when we view God as a part of our life versus being the center of our life, then we're going to make decisions based on what's best for our life. And this, he's not the only one. You can pull up that next Luke chapter 9. After he told them, take up your cross and follow me, he, he gives some examples of people who weren't willing to follow him. He said they were going along the way and someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Come on, have you ever had that moment where you've just experienced the presence of God in such an amazing way? You're at church and it's like, oh, you're, God, I'll do anything for you.
And Jesus didn't look at him and say, okay, here's my Instagram handle. My, you can follow me. This is where you can find me on Instagram. This is my Twitter net account, so you can follow me. When I'm in your neighborhood, I'll check you out. Repost, retweet what I give you. Come to synagogue every week. Serve like he did. He looked at him in verse 58 and he said, listen, foxes have holes and the birds of the air, they have nests. But the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And obviously this guy just walked away because then it says that Jesus just turned and looked to another guy because it's like, well, do you realize the house that I, I just did renovations on my house? I just, hey, you want, nah. I like my posturepedic bed with my sleep number saved in it. I can't. To another one, he said, follow me. And, and he said, Lord, let me first go bury the dead, my, bury my father. That seems like a legitimate thing. Let me bury my father. And he looks at him and he says, let the dead bury their own dead, but for you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Now why, I mean, this seems very inconsiderate that Jesus would just say, you just lost your father and now you, you can't even go to the funeral. But he wasn't, the father wasn't dead yet. See, the tradition was that the firstborn son would get a double portion of the father's inheritance and then the rest of them would just get a single portion. So he said, God, I will follow you once my retirement is secure. <laughs> once I got my double portion, I got you. I don't know. The old man, I mean, his, his heart's kind of bad right now. He's holding on. It probably won't be that long. I'll come follow you then. God isn't looking for de 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 delayed obedience. The disciples, Jesus said, follow me, and they got out of the boat. Elisha threw the cloak and kept walking. Elijah threw the cloak and kept walking. And Elisha's like, no, 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 don't leave me. No, 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 no. Whoa, whoa. I'm not missing out on this opportunity. I'm coming after you. He goes on and said, yet another one said, I'll follow you, Lord. Probably sees the other two walking away and he realizes he, he ain't got no money, so it ain't no big deal. I'm broke. My dad's broke, so I don't have to worry about retirement either. Like, I'm, I'm good. He says, but let me first go say farewell to those that are at home. And Jesus said, the person who puts his hand to the plow and turns back, he's not fit for the kingdom of God. Jesus knew and when he walked home, there'd be all those people saying, that ah, just seems a bit radical. That just seems a bit extreme. Are you sure you want to do that? Listen, I had people do that to us over planting his church. I had family members who love God. I mean, my grandma loves God, serves God. I mean, just prayer warrior. And she just told me, she said, Brandon, you... You can't come up here. Like you, you're comfortable there. That church takes care of you so well there. If you come up here, you may not even get paid. People don't like the tithe word around here. They don't. Why is she saying it? Because she was a pastor's wife. She saw all that. She knew my grandpa had to work jobs and everything to try to keep it because people weren't bringing money into the church and all that. She knew she had felt the pain of that before and she didn't want me. She did it because she loved me. And you will have well-meaning people who love you tell you you are going crazy to take that step of faith. And so Jesus didn't want him to go be talked out of it. He said, no, I want you to come now. If you're going to come, I want you to come now. I got to leave my family. I got to leave. No, I'm not. But how many times have we prayed for revival and God's glory to be revealed in, in our state? And we want God to, to move. You know how it comes? 
by taking up our cross and following him. In Romans chapter 8, Paul had, I'm going to quote 29 so you don't have to go look for it. Paul had just told them that who God foreknew, he had also predestined that they would be conformed into the image of their son, that Jesus would have been the firstborn among many brethren. So he'd given them the purpose. This is the plan that I have for you. Your plan is that you look like Jesus. That's God's desire. You, you want to know what the will of God for your life is? Look like his son. Okay? And then he said, when you do this, go ahead and pull up 30 for me. He said, and, and those whom he predestined, he called. And those who he called, he justified. Which means he made them in right standing with God. He, he made the way. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to all, climb the ladders of success. It's all in God. He called you. He justified you. But then he also says this. And he said, but those who he justified, he also glorified. He put his glory upon it. The way that the glory of God gets revealed to Mount Hope, West Virginia, and Summersville, West Virginia, and the surrounding areas, is that people who have taken up their cross, denied themselves, and followed Jesus, begin to look more like him, begin to accept the call of God of not just church attendance, not just serving faithfully, not just giving and an offering every now and then, and tithing, and all of those things, begin to say, you know what, God? My life is yours. And if you want to call an audible and redirect my steps, then you call the audible and you redirect my steps. There is nothing that I have that is off limits to you. I'm denying myself and I will follow you all the way. And then I love this next verse. And he says, and because they've been glorified, if God is for us, then who can stand against us? Drug addiction can't stand against us. Pornography addiction can't stand against this. Some Marxist, communist, socialist government can't stand against this. Why? There are people all over the world who are understanding this and they're seeing revival like never before. The church in Iran, church in Afghanistan. I think Pastor Q actually posted something, sent something this week that was posted. There were pastors in Afghanistan that received a letter that said, we know who you are and we know where you are. Wanting to intimidate those pastors to stop. You know what the pastor's response were? We ain't going nowhere. Keep quiet. We ain't got time for that. We ain't going nowhere. thing we need to do honest evaluation worship team you guys can come on up honest evaluation of if pastor brandon fell today does it affect your relationship with god and if it does then you've put me as an idol in between and you're gonna you would walk away When Elijah was gone, Elisha was still holding suit. When Jesus was taken into heaven, his disciples continued the work. Once they were empowered with the Spirit, they, they went out into the community and they transformed the world. In the book of Acts, it says, these are the people who turned the world upside down. I fully believe that God wants our church to be the people who turn the world upside down. Because we understand Christianity isn't about being in these seats. It's not about just serving faithfully in church, tithing. It's about denying ourselves, laying down our lives, following Him. And when we do, we'll see the glory of God revealed. And we'll see strongholds broken. And no matter what happens with the government, we'll still see souls saved by the thousands because the thing in Iran and the revival is world, large, fastest growing church right now is in Iran and the women know that they can be raped they can be beaten and all that and they still go tell everybody about Jesus the pastors know that if they get caught 
They're going to die. They're going to lose their life. And they, and they ain't going nowhere. Taliban knows where I am. That's great. Jesus knows where I am too. And if he determines that it's my time to go, that's fine. I'll get to see Jesus quicker. But I am not leaving my post just because somebody tells me because I know who I am in Christ. And I know what I'm called to do. Call of God is far greater. Following God is far greater than attend church every now and then. Read your Bible some. And until we make that level of declaration, you won't see the glory of God revealed in your life. You won't see people that you pray for healed, set free. But when you understand who you are, some of y'all thought I was crazy earlier when I was telling you, just tell that spirit to get off of you right now. That you, spirit of depression, you gotta go now. Spirit of suicide, you gotta go now. You have no right in my life. Because when you know who you are, you know what the authority that you have. Aaron has no problem arresting somebody because he knows the authority that is back in him as being a state trooper. And if we can get the reality of the authority that God has given us, then we will have no problem taking our communities with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want you to stand to your feet. I want you just to do a little heart evaluation. Where am I with that? Am I seeing signs and wonders following me? Some of y'all are. Some of y'all, we, we started teaching some stuff, like just revealing, you know, who you are and the power that you have. And like your small groups and stuff, you're seeing people set free. You're seeing people healed. I mean, we've had deaf ears open. We've had autoimmune issues, all these different things that have happened. And it hadn't happened in the church. Tumors shrink and gone, like all this stuff. And it wasn't by stuff that was around here. It was by people in the church just saying, you know what? I'm not letting the devil steal from me anymore. And I'm not going to let him steal from my friends anymore. Listen, a small group, if you don't want to go to a group because you don't know people, then bring people in who you know and begin to preach the gospel to them. And They don't even have to go to this church. It's not about I heart church. Do you hear me? None of these things, none of the feeding projects, none of, I don't care about who gets credit for it. We have to realize that God left us here as an army to take ground, to heal the sick, to preach the gospel, to share the truth, and to set the uh, captive deliver, uh, that set the captives free. I'll get it out in a second. And that's not just me, that's you, Mickey. That's you, Tom. That's you, Chip, AC, Jason. That's you. God's put you in a dark place to bring light there. To transform that high school. Some of you teachers that are in public schools, God didn't put you there to hide your faith. God put you there to be a light. But wait a minute, I might lose my job. I might. If you lost your job, do you think that God couldn't take care of you? We just saw that Elijah was, Elisha was taken care of all the way. Elijah was taken care of all the way. Jesus' disciples, they left things behind. But God also has a way of putting people there. And no matter what comes against them, not allow God to remove them because he's put them there. We got to care more about his kingdom than we care about our lives. And when we get there, we'll see freedom. We'll see revival. We'll see life change.